You know, I'm genuinely annoyed at the revelation that I don't own a Spider-Man t-shirt. I, 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 I gotta fix that. So, Spider-Man Far From Home. I have seen it. I actually got to see it with my partner Liz. She's not joining me for the review because um, we saw it at a late night and she didn't feel like doing the review right away and then she had stuff she had to do so it's just going to be me. Um, but we had fairly similar thoughts on the thing overall. So let's do the simple question first. Um, is it better than Spider-Man Homecoming? No. Is it as good as Spider-Man Homecoming? No. Is it bad? No. So this, and, and I will also point out that it seems to be getting reviews fairly consistent with what the previous film got. So this might be a case where the things that don't work for me are unique to me. Maybe I'm the weird one here. But... This, talking about this film also puts me in a bit of an awkward situation because most of the stuff that I like, I can't talk about until I start talking spoilers, which puts me in a difficult position because it basically means keeping it, keeping the front end of this spoiler free means I'm only going to get to talk about the things that didn't work so well. So I am going to kind of talk in broad strokes for a bit. Broadly speaking, my, the simplest way to sum up my issues with this is that I found the first hour to not be exceptionally entertaining. I'm not going to say that it's not good, but what it's doing is not what I wanted. Now at about the halfway mark, about an hour in, it kicks into high gear and heads into what I wanted. And I actually really like the second, the back half of this film quite a bit. That front half, though, it's still... Yeah. Uh, okay. The previous film, Homecoming, I thought was incredibly well balanced in terms of how it juggled the school social stuff and the superhero stuff. Not just in terms of how much we got of each, but when it went from one to the other and how it flowed from one to the other. Because I know some people really like the soap opera that Spider-Man can be. That's not, like, I appreciate that that helps give Spider-Man his unique flavor, but that's not what I'm here for. That's never what I'm here for. So for me, when it's done well, which I feel it was in Homecoming, it's like, it's like good seasoning. It's, it's, it's just the right bit of spice to what I am there for, to make it a little different, a little nice. But after a cold open, the first 20 minutes of this film is uninterrupted social school non-heroics stuff. And for me, that's like giving me a, you know, going to a dinner and my first course is just a bowl of salt and pepper. I needed this sprinkled over everything else. Don't just give that to me straight. It doesn't work straight. For me, at least. And I think a lot of this just has to do with my own genre preferences because that, I mean, and a, a lot of the first hour, but that first 20 minutes especially, is really just a fairly typical high school teenage social comedy, basically. And... I don't really like those kinds of movies. That's not the kind of movie I would choose to go to. It's it's just, it's not my bag. Uh, so having, and again, I couldn't swallow it better in Homecoming because it, it I did, I wasn't getting it uncut. It was like a little bit here, a little bit there. Here's a, here's a slightly awkward moment with, uh, with Liz. Here's an awkward moment with Ned, but it wasn't like, Awkward moment, awkward moment, awkward moment, awkward moment. Like, I know Peter's awkward, and that's part of what makes him charming, but don't stack him up like that on me. And also, I feel like with some of these characters, they have upped the cringe factor, or they have upped what made them kind of funny the first time to the point that it now makes me cringe a bit. And I've talked about my 
um, dislike of cringe humor. Now, this happens actually with several characters, but the one that best exemplifies it, it there's a there's a teacher character, and he was in the previous one. He was he's the teacher with the beard, uh, and he was you know guiding the the kids in Washington D.C. And you know he's he's a bit of a dopey, you know, teacher. He's not cool. He's a little awkward, and that's fine. The amount of we got of that before was just fine. But now we get a lot more of it. And it's all consistent. It's not like he's suddenly like a different character, but it's like, oh God, they really laying it on thick this time. Oh, okay. And I, I like, I got tired. He, I thought he was funny last time. I got tired of him real fast. And that happened in a few other places. There's also a new character introduced who seems to exist simply to be a potential romantic rival for MJ, but he doesn't need to be because Peter has enough has enough rivalry or insecurity within the school characters that we know. We didn't need this guy. He doesn't add anything, and the performance is wooden as heck. I, have, I don't know why he's there. I really don't like him. Brad Jones, I think, is the character. I didn't like him at all. I don't know why he's there. Um, but, okay, I, I, again, I can talk about this without getting into spoilers. The performances are good. Tom Holland is very good. He's very lovable. He's very enjoyable. I actually quite like this interpretation of Aunt May. She is decidedly different from what we normally get from Aunt May, but I like it. Like, the changes that have been made to these characters, they never feel arbitrary. They feel informed for the vibe that this these films want to have and she feels consistent with that uh we get happy hogan in this one which is also nice because john favreau's good in that part it's kind of effortless for him at this point mvp though i gotta be honest for this whole film is zendaya as mj i liked her in the first movie i really i love her in this she is awesome and i think it's such a terrific take on mj because if you're going to attempt to update Spider-Man. And please keep in mind, update does not mean do it better. It just means bring it in line with current times. Um, if you're going to update Spider-Man, which this does, it's what the whole thing is. That because, like, the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man, it was very much, while it was set modern day, was very much deliberately designed to evoke the 60s and 70s of Spider-Man. So it was sort of deliberately anachronistic in a lot of ways, especially with the some of the character dynamics. With these films that are connected to the MCU, they are trying to be of this time and to feel of this time, not just be ostensibly set here. And so if you're going to take a character like MJ, who in the comics and in the Raimi movies was, you know, just the, the bombshell, she's pretty and everyone thinks she's awesome, and try and update, give us a slightly more modern take on that, well, you know, the pretty girls don't always automatically make them the cool ones. Sometimes the cool people are... A little bit odd, a little bit aloof, a little bit, in her case, a little bit morbid. But what I really love about her performance here is as she opens up to Peter a little bit, we see that that front, that very cool, chill front that was pretty much all we got of her in the previous film is layered over very typical teenage insecurities. That she also sells really well. And it doesn't feel like a betrayal of the character. It feels like, oh, we're getting to know you better. Just like Peter is. Oh, this is nice. This is fun. Plus, she had one line that I immediately turned to Liz and I'm like, you're going to steal that, aren't you? Um, and it's, it's been in some of the trailers, so I'll say it. Because Peter says to her, um, you look pretty. And she just turns to him and immediately goes, and therefore I have value. <laughs> and it's, it's, oh, I really did love that. Um, as far as other characters go, um, Nick Fury and Maria Hill are in this. They are, they are entertaining. They're a little odd. They're using this as a little odd, but I can't get into that without getting into spoilers, so I won't. Um, we have Jake Gyllenhaal as Mysterio, and he plays the part well. Um, and as with a lot of the film, though, I think his best stuff is in the second half, both as, in performance and as a character. Um, the action is good, the visuals are great, like, it's a good film, it's just like, it took a while to kick into gear for me, and now I am going to start to get into spoilers, because I do want to talk more about the stuff that I, I really liked, because 
you know, I've done my complaining about the front end and my praising is in the back end. So, ah, or uh, I say praising. I am going to initially start with another complaint, but it is spoilery. So part of the thing that was tough for me is that I know who Mysterio is. Now, Mysterio isn't, isn't like super unknown. I mean, like if you know Spider-Man at all, you know Mysterio, but he's not like, you know, he he's not iconic. He's got a pretty distinct look, but he's not like, oh, everybody knows him. He's not, he's not an equivalent of like the Joker or the Riddler or like, oh yeah, no, we've heard of him. It's like, wait, who? So I don't know how genuinely they were trying to have it be a twist that he's the, spoilers, that he's the villain. But, um, the fact that, and, and the thing is, I'm not sure they are because, after the movie's over, I asked Liz, like, how quickly did you cordon on that he was going to be a problem? And she was like, oh, almost immediately. I'm like, did you know about that character ahead of time? She's like, no, nope, but I just figured. So I don't think they're actually trying to play it as a twist, which makes it all the weirder to me that they kind of let him appear to be a good guy for an hour. An hour of runtime almost. Like, that's that's too long um, to be to be playing that shell game when... I definitely anyone who knows the character at all and anyone who's like paying any attention, even if they don't know the character, can probably figure out that there's something weird going on with this guy. And so I think they wait too long to, to let the other shoe drop on that. Once they do, we get some really good stuff. There is an action sequence in the middle of this film that is like the first real, it's the first proper use of Mysterio's holographic illusions in combat when he's fighting Spider-Man, it's so cool. The way he messes with Spider-Man's sense of where things are, where he is, what's going on around him. I'm not going to talk any of the specifics about this action sequence, but I love it so much. The way that he he keeps him on the back foot and disoriented, and it's all happening so fast that you totally buy that. Even though Peter knows this all has to be fake, it's still happening to him so fast and he has to react so quickly that something's happening. He's like, I have to assume that that might be real because if it, if I'm wrong, this goes really bad. And Mysterio is using that against him. It's really, really good. Like, especially compared to how we've usually seen Mysterio depicted, like when he's shown up in cartoons or what, he just, you know, creates this, like, this one illusion. This this sequence, Mysterio is like creating this free flowing environment where like this becomes this. It's like it's it's like a fun house dream logic on speed. It's awesome. Um, and the the later combat scenes aren't quite at the same level as that one in the middle, but they're also good. Um, I like that Mysterio. I like that Mysterio has an entire team of people made up of folks who felt screwed over by Tony Stark. Because, let's be honest, as much as Tony was a hero, Tony also left a long legacy of being a jerk. And we had that a bit with um, the Vulture before, and now we get it a bit more. But it does feel distinct enough from the Vulture, because with the Vulture, that was when Tony screwed over the little guy. Um, and probably inadvertently, probably not meaning to. Whereas a lot of these folks were were like actually in Tony's employ and were screwed over more directly um, than uh, Adrian Veidt, aka the Vulture, was. So that's kind of cool. Um, I like that we get a few like very specific who this person was, um, and you know with reference to earlier films, that's kind of a neat touch. I like that. I mentioned Fury and Maria Hill being a little off. They feel off in terms of the performance. They're fun. They're engaging. They're kind of funny. They feel a little off. Which basically gets retconned in the, um, in the post credit sequence. Because we find out at the end, that's not Maria Hill and Nick Fury. That's a couple of... That's Telos uh, and I forget the other scroll. Um, the other scroll's name, but that's a couple of scrolls pretending to be Nick Fury and Maria Hill. Nick Fury's off world right now, and that is that was an interesting twist. I don't think they should ever try and pull this trick again, 
But that was kind of a neat way to have their cake and eat it too, because they, for the sake of this story, and I think they did kind of, because Nick Fury has to fall for Mysterio's shtick. He, otherwise the story doesn't work properly. And he also still kind of does have to be there because somebody needs to be pressuring Peter to be in the places where he's going to be for things to go. And Nick Fury basically recruiting him because other Avengers are busy, that serves that function. So he has a narrative reason to be there. And also the narrative kind of demands that he not be as on his game as he usually is. So they managed to, to have Nick Fury fill his narrative function even though it felt slightly out of character, and then justified in the end credit sequence. Like I said, having your cake and eat it too, it's actually really clever. I was I was quite impressed with that. Um, trying to think what else. I think um, the initially I was kind of thrown off by the whole thing with Edith. Um, initially sort of thinking like, would Tony actually have trusted Peter with something like, something that big, that dangerous? But then I stopped and thought about like, yeah. Yeah, he might, because I think he kind of saw Peter as potentially the next him. And in his mind, he could handle all that. And Peter will be fine. You know, not having a full appreciation of how young Peter is. Um, we got a couple different suits in this. We get the black self suit, the, the night monkey suit, um, yeah, which is fine. It, it, it works. Um, and then we get the, the red and black, which I, I, I really do enjoy that Peter got to work the materials and design it himself. And we take that pause where Happy sees him, you know, with the holograms, piecing the suit together. And he never says, you know, you look like Tony, but we can just see what Peter's doing. And if we didn't make the connection already, we see the look on Happy Hogan's face and be like, oh, yeah. So there's some nice nods to, to Tony and to Iron Man, which it kind of needed given how important he was in the previous film. Uh, in the specific, you know, when I say previous, I mean Homecoming, not like previously released, though he was important in that too, because that was Endgame. Anyway, you know what I mean. Why am I over clarifying? So like, really, once this thing hit, hit the halfway mark, it really took off and it really clicked for me, pretty much from for the entire remainder of the runtime. But that first hour, I checked my watch twice. I don't check my watch during Marvel movies, as a rule of thumb. I don't check my watch during most movies. So if I'm checking my watch at all, that's a problem. If I'm checking my watch twice, in just a half length of the movie, that's a big problem. Or at least it's an indicator that something's really not working for me. And I don't want to be like, I'm checking my watch going, God, when is this over? I was checking my watch going, how long have we been doing? So like when I said 20 minutes an hour, I'm not guessing. I know that's how long it was, that it was 20 continuous minutes of high school cringe humor. And that it was an hour until it kicked into a gear that made me go, yeah! Because I was checking my watch. So, once it got good, it got real good. And, and thank goodness, too, because it reminded me of all the things that I loved about the previous film. And also, absolutely stay for the end credits. Well, why am I saying this? I'm in the complete spoiler section. So, I'll just talk about the other end credit thing. The way that they ended, I'm actually going to be really curious to see how this goes. So, we get J. Jonah Jameson back. Basically, it's the version of J. Jonah Jameson from the PS4 video game. He is an online... But he's basically Alex Jones. Basically. But they got J.K. Simmons back, which they kind of had to, because no one else can be... J. Jonah Jameson. It just won't work. Um, but I do like that, you know, he's bald and like he's not the literal same guy. He looks different enough and his presentation is completely different in terms of how he's delivering his information and his message. So it makes it very clear that this is a distinctly different version of, of uh, J. Jonah Jameson than we got when J.K. Simmons did it so perfectly in the Raimi films. Now, the ending is, uh, the ending of the first, of the, this is the mid-credit thing, is kind of interesting in that it mirrors what happened at the end of Homecoming when Aunt May, um, you know, saw that Peter was Spider-Man, you know, what the? And then doing it now with 
J. Jonah Jameson dropping that Peter is Spider-Man on the world, um, as set up by Mysterio, because... <laughs> Which was also a nice thing. Like this, this was actually major stuff. I'm surprised they held some of this for mid credit. But I, I like, I was wondering because he was like, "No, we're gonna move forward even after the illusion of the elemental broke down." That was a cool way to like sort of offhandedly have villains like Hydra Man and Molten Man just adding that in there. And then, you know, his his compatriot was like, "I don't know how you're gonna spin this. I wondered that too, and now we know." I do worry a little bit about what the next film picking up is going to be like now, though, because if they follow through with this and Peter's cover is blown, that worries me because Spider-Man's the only character Marvel's doing the secret identity with. And it's not that I, like, love the secret identity, but that's the one well that they have to tap that sort of thing in. Most of the other characters, definitely the ones that are leading their own franchises, are kind of known to the public who they are. And I worry about them removing one of the things that is unique to this character within the cinematic universe. But we won't know until it picks up next time. It actually honestly turned out that Aunt May finding out what ended up not being a very big deal. So maybe this will be a similar thing. I don't know. We'll see. But once it got good, it got very good. Took a little while to get there, though. Spider-Man, Far From Home. You've seen it. What'd you think about it? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. There's a bunch of stuff to do down there, too, because there's the Patreon where you can support me. Really appreciate it. Um, there's also, you know, subscribe and the like button. That's a big help. And, you know, all sorts of links down there for my socials and my book and my P.O. Box, etc., etc., etc. Check them out or don't. I, like, I really appreciate it, but I'm not going to tell you what you have to do, because at the end of the day, folks, you're the council. I'm just running meetings, and until next time, this council is adjourned.